All right. Welcome, everybody. We are just about to cross the top of the hour here, so I'm going to go ahead and get the presentation started. My name is Max Rohr. I'm going to be hosting the webinar today. Today's issue of edition, uh, whatever the word would be for Coffee with Cleffy, is zoned in. We're going to be talking about zone valves and relays, some best practices and selection guides and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the slides here. If you are having any issues with GoToWebinar, best case scenario, just close out a GoToWebinar and come back in. That's usually the quickest way to remedy it. They do have a tech support number, but usually the best way is just to quit and, and rejoin. We will have a copy of today's presentation as a PDF. Just hit yes in the post-webinar survey. And then we'll also have this up on YouTube so you can refer to it if you have to leave early or want to share it with somebody else in the future. We'll get that up probably later today or tomorrow. Certificate of attendance. So we will send you this and it will show what the course was about, uh, the number of hours. So in some cases you can self-report those. We're happy to uh, supply that for you. And then our most uh, recent edition of Hydronics is Troubleshooting Hydronics Systems. This is out now. You can get a hard copy of this. You can go to the hydronics.kalefi.com so you can see kind of more resources related to this. It's more like a long uh, scroll website newspaper type uh, version of hydronics.kalefi.com. And we also have a PDF that you can download to your local drive or something like that as well. So a few different ways to get hydronics. Next month, we're gonna be covering a topic that will actually coordinate with the 33rd edition of Hydronics. So Hydronics 33 is going to be on heat pump water heater fundamentals. We'll have that ready to view for the next webinar in July. And I'll be walking through some of the applications and ways to use heat pump water heaters and to decide if and how a heat pump water heater would be a good fit for a project that you're looking at, either residential or commercial. And today, I am going to bring onto the line Greg Tubbs and Bob Hot Rod Roar. They're going to walk us through some of the slides today and cover the, the topic. And I will do a quick introduction here for both of these guys. So Greg is an application engineer. He has 20 years of experience, a lot of it in the field. He's one of the voices you'll hear if you call the tech support lines. Uh, he's the person that I call if I'm looking for some sort of confirmation like, hey, Greg, did I size this right? Or do I know what I'm talking about here? I usually will send Greg an email or a chat or give him a call or something like that to make sure that I'm pointed in the right direction to give good advice to the customers. Really good on the tech support lines, has a, a good temperament for it. So he's going to walk us through some of the things that have come up over the years on the tech support line today. Uh, also with us today, we have Bob Hot Rod Roar, a 2020 through 2023 uh, Carlson Holohan Industry Excellence Award winner. He got an extra bonus year there because of COVID because we didn't have the, the handoff. Uh, he has 40 years of experience in the trade as a master plumber. Uh, I also call him quite a bit because he's my father for a ride to the airport or for help uh, doing the rough and plumbing in my basement. So we've got a lot of field experience on the call today and we'll get started with uh, the slides. So welcome guys. Thank you. Okay. So to start with, we'll go over a little bit of the, the topics that will be covered in the webinar. Uh, here's what we're gonna be up to today. So a lot of this relates to products that, that we sell. Sometimes we do these Coffee with Galefi webinars on topics that we don't really have any product in our catalog related to this. This will be a webinar where we're gonna talk about a lot of products that we sell. It won't be a sales pitch. It's gonna be how do you apply these products properly and these fundamentals would work with other products as well. So we're gonna try and give you an industry overview of zoning with valves and uh, pumps and also relay boards to make sure that we've got kind of the right selection for the right project. So we'll talk about uh, when to use one or the other, connection options, CVs, how to select uh, different zone valves based on the CV, and what to do if things don't go as expected, I guess. And those are uh, kind of how we'll wrap up the webinar. So to start with, we wanted to send a poll out. So I think we're going to have Paul launch this. We want to get a baseline for how would you size a zone valve? If somebody called today and say, I need a new zone valve, what is your next step? What information do you want to know next? 
and this is something that Greg, you can probably weigh in here from the tech support line. Uh, when somebody says, hey, what zone valve do I need? You're gonna get uh, a lot of different information next from you know things that are useful for sizing and some things that are uh, helpful to know maybe, but aren't really a key decision factor here. So we'll kind of see what the audience says here. We'll leave this open for about 40 seconds and then we'll get kind of a baseline for where the audience would start with the uh, selection process for the zone valves. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. Looks like it's loading up. Okay, maximum flow rate was the winner with 40%, 41% of the vote. So that's a good number to use. Uh, it looks like a kind of a second CV value and then pipe size. So um, Bob and Greg, are there any right answers here? Is there only one of these that is required or do you need to know a couple of these different things at a minimum? Well, if I can weigh in quick first, yeah. my experience has always been we get somebody calling in looking for a replacement or they're just building a job. They know they're gonna pipe it in three quarter. They're looking for a three quarter zone valve. You know, They know their pipe size. They don't take into account really the flow rate. And I just talked to a, con, uh, a contractor today that CV was a number he wasn't very familiar with. So we had a discussion about what the CV was and kind of how it correlates to flow rate. And bottom line, like he was looking at the seven and a half CV because that's what everybody stocks. That's the most commonly sold and commonly stocked um, zone valve. So he's going, well, you know, after he figured out what, what that correlated in GPM, it would have been much bigger than what he ever would have needed for this job. A small house, maybe a thousand square feet and, and two zones. So he uh, he elected to go to a smaller CV. Yeah, and that's a, that's kind of the perfect conversation to narrow it down a little bit more. We'll cover in some uh, slides towards the end uh, with some pictures of different CVs, how you would select a, a valve based on CV there. All of those different things that we mentioned in the poll uh, the flow rate, the CV, close off pressure required, pipe size, all of these are useful, but definitely that CV is going to help us find the right orifice size essentially for the zone valve to give us the proper performance there. If you want to read more about this, was this was one of our first uh, hydronics issues back in 2009. Uh, issue number five goes into a lot of detail about that as well. We'll kind of cover some highlights in the webinar today. Okay, so We'll start with kind of three categories of zone valves. Greg, do you want to tell us uh, a kind of an overview of these and we'll go into a little bit of detail for each of them? Absolutely. Um, you know, starting from left and going right, we have our, our thermal electric type, um, much smaller, smaller, more compact zone valve. Not a super commonly used valve, but there's some cases where guys would prefer to use that one and they, they do. Um, next up would be our Z1, that is a, a motorized spring return, normally normally closed type of uh, zone valve available in a lot of different combinations, and we'll get to those in a minute. Um, most commonly used in residential and light commercial application zone systems. And then we have our motorized ball valve type zone valve, that guy we usually see that in like a pump and dump geo type system because of its high close off. Okay, let's uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail for each of these then. Um, so for thermoelectric, what is what's a you know best case scenario for a thermoelectric? Honestly, thermoelectric we like to see them used uh, in a low temp zone type application. You know we're kind of limited in temperature. Um, they're they're real simple, you know. You can get them in two wire or four wire if you need an end switch. Um, they're very slow open and slow close. So the old saying goes, "A watch pot never boils." If there's one question I get a lot on the tech line, is a guy just applies power, they take a little over a minute to fully open, and if 20 seconds goes by and that thing's not open, they're kind of they're kind of getting a little nervous, so they call and come to find out that, you know, 
hey, the, the relay panel is delivering 24 volts to it. It just takes a very long time to heat up and open. You know, another selling, another selling feature of this valve is they're perfectly quiet. So if you're going to put this in like a closet next to your master bed or bedroom, you won't hear this valve at all. You will hear a, you know, a spring return valve, even the motorized ball valve, you'll hear that gear train a little bit. So these get applied sometimes if you have to have a valve that you don't want to hear it opening and closing at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so available. Be, yeah, tell me about that. Um, so the size is you know, a little bit more limited with the, the size range than, than what we'll talk about in the next couple slides here. Um, so where would you use this as, Greg, an individual valve, kind of like we show here versus a radiant manifold? What are you know kind of the differences in applications there? Yeah, in this case, I mean, you're looking at something where it probably be going to like a panel radiator um, or a bank of panel radiators. You could probably use it for uh, lower temp uh, baseboard. You don't want to bury these things in a baseboard cabinet because they're limited in their temperature. You know, 120 degrees, so 32 to 120 degree operating temperature. So you don't want to bury it someplace where there's no air getting to it. Um, they'll never close off. Yeah, so that wax element there that we show with kind of the copper color there, that if that were in the, you know, if you buried that into the baseboard enclosure there, you're going to have a hot wax actuator all the time and aren't going to get the performance that you need versus, like you're saying, kind of moving it to the left or the right of that enclosure so it gets some some cool air to wash over it so it's not just tricked hot all the time. Right. Um, so what would be the, you mentioned kind of the open closed, so this will take a second for this green top to pop open. One of the things I like about this style of valve is you can walk into a mechanical room and see which ones have the green tops and which one are which ones are closed? A, a quick visual inspection, get kind of a baseline there. So if you wanted to just double check your wiring really quick, how does this hand mode work? What does that mean? Yeah, so if you open it, you're manually opening the valve. So it, it, it'll bypass the electrical side of it and just manually trip that open. And then it makes the end switch, which is helpful if you have a four wire version. So it makes the end switch. And one of the things that I like too, is that once it power cycles, it goes back to automatic mode. <laughs> so if you leave a zone valve in manual mode and forget about that and have to go take it back out and you get a call that all the zones are overheating, it could be stuck in manual mode. Once this power cycles once, it's you'll hear it snap back into that, that automatic mode, which is kind of a callback saver as well. So this last bullet point here limitation of 20 psi close off so where could you get a little outside of the the use of this valve with a high psi close off greg where where could this go wrong so large where i see the biggest problem the, the application i see it in is large apartments or condo complexes where they have a pump running all the time that's not adjustable it's a single speed pump and the head of that pump once some of the zones start to close down, that pressure needs a place to go. So it forces its way through a valve like this. Okay, so we'll talk about kind of where uh, you could go valve selection wise, if that is a key criteria that, that close off pressure and you anticipate seeing more than 20 PSI. There's really high use of this valve in Europe where they've been using variable speed pumps for a lot longer too. So this is a great pairing with an ECM circulator is gonna be low pump energy, low circulator energy, paired with uh, low electrical energy to keep this thing open that we'll look at in an oscilloscope uh, chart a little bit later in the presentation as well. The okay. other thing about that, that wax yeah. actuator, if I could jump in, is if you put them out in the garage or in a cold spot, they take even longer to open because that little heating wire that goes around that copper element has to take that wax from whatever ambient temperature that actuator's in and bring it up. So in a cold garage, it's say 30 degrees and you turn the heat on probably gonna take another minute to open fully because you gotta heat that wax from that low temperature. That's the opposite of where they stay open if you got you know ambient air is too warm around it, the wax stays molten and it, they don't close tight. So you know that too. That's a good point. So what about Greg, the motorized spring return style? So what are some, some highlights with this type of, of zone valve? 
Yeah, I mean, they're a great zone valve to use, in, you know, bread and butter is, is residential and, and like commercial zone systems. Uh, they work great for that. I mean, and if you size them properly, they'll work great in, you know, larger complexes too. If you have, uh, you know, we're, again, we're fighting that, that getting the right CV, the right close off range uh, for them to work properly and not give you any trouble. But we, we have a lot of different varieties of these in connection type CV and uh, different types of motor, normally open, normally closed, 24 volt to 120, um, end switch, no end switch. Honestly, if you guys have questions or looking for something, you know, maybe you're not sure what you need, call us and we, we walk you right through it. We go through that list of many products we have and we help people make the right selection. And this but, one, we pointed out as well that this max temperature is going to be higher. So if you did have an application where the ambient temperature is a little bit higher or whatever is you know, the, the fluid or even up to 15 PSI steam can be a fit here where you, you wouldn't want to use that through that, that thermoelectric actuator that's going to be outside of tolerance there. I put this screen grab in the middle. It's, it's too small to read. But one of the things with this valve is there are, like Greg's saying, many, many, many different combinations of half inch sweat with a delta P maximum you know, related to the CV here. So this is going to be something that you know a wholesaler may stock a couple versions of this. If you're looking at a, a new project and you really want to dial it in, uh, you have to go to the chart and kind of find exactly what version is going to be the, the best fit here. You could probably have a couple of these on your truck for different troubleshooting applications, uh, but this is definitely something we can really dial in for the, the project based on a, a, a wide variety of, of options. So this valve, one other thing yeah, is also available as a normally open and a normally close, and be aware of that when you go to change out an actuator because there, there's engineers out there that are still designing buildings with a, you know normally open valves, and if you put the wrong head on it, then that's not going to give you the result that you're looking for. So be sure that you look at the uh, the actuators when you swap one out. Make sure you get the right uh, configuration back in there. And that's maybe going into a little bit more detail with the power consumption of normally open versus normally closed for like a hydronic system. So what does that mean for all summer with normally open versus normally closed? Oh, for me? Yeah, so yeah, sure. normally... Uh, Normally, open valves are going to be powered all summer, and that's where they can overheat. Like in a, um, we'll see them in like uh, dorms at universities, and they do that. So if the power goes out, there's heat in the room. It, you get a little bit of gravity circulation, but know that that, you know, it's consuming power all summer, uh, holding it in that position. So there's kind of a trade-off there when you do that type of uh, application with the normally uh, normally open type of valves. Yeah. Okay, let's go over to the last category here. So, Greg, what's uh, what's a strong point for a, a motorized ball valve uh, in use yeah. for, for zoning? So, motorized bone, uh, ball valves, I mean, tight close off, uh, 150 psi. They're they're high flow. They've got a bigger CV uh, because it's a motorized ball valve. Uh, we got them in two and three way configurations. Uh, most commonly, they're used as diverters or uh, for pump and dump applications. Um, they do have a removable actuator, just like all the rest of them do that we provide. Um, the biggest limitation, though, is you got to wire this thing right. It needs to be powered open and power closed. It does not have a spring return on it. So that's something to take in consideration. And uh, we walk, walk people through wiring those all the time. We always have a, a diagram to send out for, for people to, to use. And we've uh, we've got that in the wiring section of the presentation, so we'll get to that specifically in the, the slides as well. So yeah, a little bit different application here. This uh, this ball, you can kind of see the, the diverting uh, character of that, that machine ball valve as well. So a little bit different animal probably than the other two, as you're saying, for like a pump and dump that you could actually you know, open and, and drain uh, a big system and then close it back up where you wouldn't want to use a paddle style to do the, the same thing or a thermoelectric with that high flow rate. It's also okay, good so for off, off gridders because there's no power consumption. Once it goes open, there's no current draw through that. So if you're looking to squeeze every 
kilowatt hour your PV system if you're off grid. That's a good valve to use for that too. Yeah, and we'll show a, a kind of overlay of all three of those on a chart with the the amount of you know, power the the current that you're going to require to keep a valve in operation like that with the three of them. So we'll start with a couple installation examples here. So there are a lot of different ways to zone a system. We have kind of a, a simple diagram here without even calling out which of the two zone, two-way zone valves that we're showing here. So let's say this is an ECM circulator. We show a differential bypass valve there. Do we still need that if we have an ECM pump that's gonna modulate up and down? No. So we're seeing that a lot that in the, you know, in modern hydronic systems that we're moving away from the ECM circulator, or sorry, away from the PSC circulators, we can take this piece out because what that's allowing the circulator to do is in a single speed application. And what was the example that, that you were talking about with the number of zones, Bob, yeah, that it's good it's to... It's a rule of thumb, but we've always told people if you have more than four zone valves on a single speed pump, you should look at a bypass valve because you're going to over pump that single zone valve that's open. You're going to be over pumping that when all the other ones are closed. So, and I like seeing it applied like this. Sometimes you'll see a, a bypass valve at the at the top end after all the zone valves. But in this case here, when you're bypassing, you don't have to go all the way up that red line to go through your bypass to come back down. So a lot less heat loss and flow going through that line. But yeah, that's that's one rule of thumb is if you have more than uh, four zone valves on a single pump, you should probably look at putting a pressure activated bypass. I mean, what we're trying to do is take a pump curve and make it a straight line. In the perfect world, pump curve wouldn't have a curve. It would be a straight line giving you just the right uh, pressure as you as you change your flow rate demand on the system and we can do that with this valve although it's parasitic that pump is still using say 80 watts to do the work and you're just shedding some of that back kind of like driving with your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time but uh, it gets a job done doing it with an ECM you're going to get two wins as you're going to modulate that flow exactly like you need it and you're going to use a lot less power to run that ECM pump um, to uh, you know as opposed to a PSC type of type of motor so you get two wins by using the nerves but we still offer it i think maybe in the next whatever five years if ever we get to a point where electronic pumps are mandated by the government that valve will probably go away because the pump's going to take care of uh of this task that the valve's doing yeah so one disadvantage here too is the differential bypass uh since this pump is just going full speed one speed you're going to take the hottest water from the simple boiler here and dump it right back into the return. So if that was a modulating condensing boiler, the outlet's 140, you may be sending back 139 and a half. So you could short cycle that, that equipment a little bit there. So the nice thing about the ECM circulators is you can kind of just make it do this pump curve and set either a variable pressure or a, a constant pressure setting is going to be really friendly to this type of zoning. And that can be you know, helpful to not go overflow with the different zones or the, in extreme cases, you know, that you could push a paddle open if the CV was improperly uh, selected or something like that and have some ghost flow issues there too. So that's something to mention. It, all of this is getting easier with the circulator technology, I would say. Okay, Bob, do you wanna walk us through what's the difference between these, the pictures of the zone valves here? I think this was from your workbench. So what are we looking at with these different orifice sizes of these zone valves? Yeah, so that's just a selection of our different valves and different uh, connection configurations as well as different CVs. And so what you notice is the valve is the CV of the valve uh, gets smaller, goes down. So the one on the very left, there is a one CV valve. Um, the hole gets smaller in the, in the uh, orifice in the opening. And the reason for that is so when the paddle has to close off against that opening to shut the flow, the smaller the opening, the easier it is to shut that flow off so we can shut off a higher pressure. I know I'm seeing it on the chart over there on the right, on a, uh, a one CV valve, you can see we've got a 75 pound pressure shut off with that valve on the left. The valve on the right being a 7.5 CV valve, you go over to the chart thing, you can see that only uh, can shut off against 20 pounds pressure differential. So you say, well, why would I ever want a valve with a small opening and a low CV? 
And where those get applied mainly is uh, we do OEM work for a lot of the fan coil manufacturers. They don't know what kind of pump is going to be attached to that fan coil when they put a thousand of them in a high rise in Las Vegas. Let's say they could have a base mount pump downstairs that's developing 60 pounds of pressure differential. So by putting a low CV valve, they assure that they've got the highest shutoff pressure, uh, not knowing what the pump that's going to be applied to that zone valve is. So that's where you'll see them, and that's where for the fellows that do commercial uh, service work or repair work. That's where you want to make sure that if you're replacing a zone valve or an actuator, that you look at the CV of that valve. If you put a 20 CV valve on a job like a high rise in Vegas, again, let's call it, there's a good chance the heat's not going to shut off in the room or the cooling because the pump is going to push that little pad open. So we give you quite a, a selection there. You can see we go from a 1, 2.5, 3.5, 5, and even a 7.5. Um, your go-to valve for most residential guys is going to be the 7.5. They want as much flow as they can. A little, you know, uh, wet rotor circulator is probably only developing, you know, six, eight pounds of pressure differential. You got plenty of capacity in that valve, but it's the uh, bigger job. And the last thing I'll say is that on the bottom there, that little chart, and we've got this available if you want. It's a little spreadsheet that Mike, our engineer, put together. And what you can do with that in the yellow boxes, you can insert, if you know the CV of the valve, and you know the flow rate, you can put it in there and you can see what the shutoff is available. And you can use it in any configuration. If you don't know the CV of the valve, but you can measure the pressure differential, you can calculate what that CV is so you make sure you get the right valve. So this kind of, and that works for anything, by the way. It's not just for zone valves. It could be a mixing valve, it could be a ball valve, it could be a Y strainer, it could be a check valve. If you want to know what the, um, you know, the pressure drop is going through a 7 CV valve over there on the right, you know the flow is 13 gallons a minute. You can see what the, uh, it's going to give you that calculation. So if you get, anybody wants that, let us know. We'll send you that spreadsheet. It's pretty handy for sizing and troubleshooting for everybody. And then one thing on this slide that I'll mention is we've got this little low lead symbol next to a couple of the zone valves. There are, and I'm kind of off book a little bit here, there are some applications where people will do a mixed hydronic and plumbing system. Um, my short recommendation there would be to not do that. <laughs> there are some ways that you can kind of work around that with different CVs and you know low lead body that would be applicable for plumbing systems. We've never really seen a, a building that's done a great job of mixing hydronic and plumbing that doesn't become kind of a big Legionella risk and you're trying to uh, use different pressures for uh, what would be a much lower pressure hydronic system versus a much higher pressure plumbing system. It's a hard thing to merge um, so just as a, a kind of a, a side general recommendation, we do have a low lead version of our zone valve and some configurations, but those combination heating and plumbing systems are, are something that we generally uh, have customers avoid if possible. And the other thing too with that is uh, it's an introduction to a lot of oxygen, right? Yeah. So oxygen's hard on separators. It's hard on a lot of a lot of parts and pieces, and we've seen some systems where they don't use the right types of pumps or other parts in the system and they will rust and corrode and fail eventually yeah so just two technologies that are kind of hard to to merge well okay so we're going to play a video here um, bob do you want to give us a little bit of a an overview of of how the motorized zone valve works that's kind of a, a little different than the yeah, so, so the way it works is, you know, when you put power to the motor, a little synchronous motor in there winds open and opens the valve. And when you take power off of that, that spring that's in there, some of them use like pullback springs. We use more of a, a wound rotary spring in it. That's what closes that valve. So if you think about that, is that when that valve opens, it's opening against that spring tension and you're winding all that spring tension, all that inertia into that paddle. So when that paddle closes, if you take a slow motion video and put it up to a other brands, I will say, of uh, zone valves, when they close, that paddle actually hits the end and it bounces once or twice until all that spring inertia is wound out of that motor. It's like a little flywheel that you build in there and it winds and it bounces like that. And that's where you can get a um, water hammer. If you've got a zone valve that, you know, it closes and you hear a bang, bang, bang a couple of times, it's that paddle trying to come to rest. So the engineers got together and said, well, what if we put like a let's call it a clutch mechanism. And the analogy I use is, let's say if you've got a stick shift truck and you come up to a stop sign and you don't push in the clutch pedal and you just push it on the brake, it's gonna ka-chug, ka-chug until you stall the engine. So 
what this little lost motion gear and that little tab that goes into that 270 degrees of lost motion that we router into that gear, it dis disconnects the motor from the spring. So when we shut that valve off and it closes, now we've got that motion, that 270 degrees that the paddle can shut and stop and then that spring tension winds out of that motion. And the other thing it does is when the valve first goes to open, it has to open against that spring tension. So by having the lost motion, the motor can spin around and get up to RPM before it engages, uses up the lost motion and opens the valve. So we take the spring tension off of the shaft and off the uh, motor, which can uh, cause the wear on the motor by disengaging it when we open it, disengaging when we close it. And really all it took was just to put that little, um, <clears throat> well, you'll see in the video how it works, that little uh, cut in there is takes up that, that motion and it Let helps with that. Uh, uh, I'll launch this here. This is Or you'll have to unmute yourself, I think, since the video played. So there's the other thing. Um, while you're there, you can see that the gears, and we've got an actual transmission in our zone valve. It's not just a pinion and a sector gear that's stamped out of brass. So you can see where it wound through, caught up to that lost motion, and now it opens. And notice, too, the spring that we put in there, we wind the tension on that spring. In the bottom, you'll see a little plus mark where we put a little torque wrench in there and wind it. So all of them get the same close off pressure. You can't do that with like a, a screen door type of spring. You're, you're dependent on the manufacturer to make sure all those springs give you the right tension, but we can actually wind exactly the tension we use. Now let's see when it, we disengage it. You see the, the spring is pulling the, the paddle closed in there. And that see the lost motion goes out. So the paddle closed, you can tell by the spring, went against its seat stop, and then that motion wound that spring tension that's still in there in the motor, it wound it out. So it, it was just a way to, um, you know, make a little better zone valve, it's not a valve that's not under spring tension all the time, and also, uh, you know, helps with uh, water hammer issues that some of the other brands, they say, well, unhook one of the springs, but when you unhook one of the springs, you've changed the close-off pressure of that valve. So now your, you know, your 20 PSI close-off pressure on an 8CV zone valve is no longer 20 PSI when you unhook one of the springs, because that's what's giving you that, that close-off pressure. So it's it's a kind of a you know a hack out there, but just know that you're giving up one thing for something else when you unhook a spring. I think that's it. They don't come in that color though. <laughs> yeah, this is a special uh, um, Italian uh, animation that we had all the extra colors there. We have to 3D print that or something to get the the colors like that. Okay, so let's say. Um, you have a suspicion that the zone valve is not working well. So with the motorized zone valve, what can you do in the field to kind of see what's going on there? Yeah, so the call will be, you know, I've got my thermostat turned all the way down and there's still heat coming out of my uh, radiant or my baseboard or whatever it might be controlling. And so basically something stuck in the zone valve is what happens is the paddle can't close. So on the cloth is you can take that bottom cap, which is a fine thread and an O-ring, so you don't need a pipe wrench, Put a little channel locks on there and you can take that out and you can look on the right there you can look up in there and see where the paddle is coming in, in contact with the seat and there's going to be a piece of teflon tape there's going to be a copper shaving there's going to be a solder ball a piece of gravel there's going to be something stuck between that that seat and that paddle so by being able to drop the bottom out like this you can just reach up in there with your finger or q-tip or something and clean off that um uh, that seat or the seal wherever that the, the debris might be stuck in there if you get to a point where there's a chunk of rubber got uh, gouged out of there from something going through there and tearing it apart, you can take that little snapping off the top, drop the stem out, and you can actually replace that whole, um, you get a new paddle, you get a new stem, and it has two O-rings, and that's a stainless steel shaft. It's not a chrome-plated brass like some other brands use, so it's got a lot more um, resistance to wear as it turns, and the double O-rings uh, seal a lot better, obviously, than one O-ring. So it's rebuildable, it's serviceable, uh, it's long lasting with the stainless steel and the paddle. One last thing, I can say one last thing. Um, it's a, a peroxide cured EPDM. And so, what we do is we take an EPDM, and when you peroxide cure EPDM, just like when you perox, uh, peroxide cure packs, you cross link it. And when you cross link a material, it becomes much more stable for like chlorinated water, chloramines, uh, aggressive glycols, and stuff like that. It just, it just treats the rubber and makes it a little bit more. Uh, resistant to the things that cause rubbers to go bad in hydronic systems, which is water, uh, bad water quality or bad glycol quality. So 
yeah, quite a few wins there with the, um, you know, with the engineering that we put into making it a little bit different or better than what everybody else has got up there. And I think that the valve selection, so this is sweat that's integral to the valve. You can also get the union connection style too, that now we've got the, the posi stop, our new O-ring connection, that's gonna be really easy to take that valve out of service and put it back in. If you did use the sweat connection, out and put it back in. So that's where kind of the little access window into the bottom can be useful there. Okay, so what happens if either a zone valve is installed backwards or the circulators installed backwards. What what are you going to notice in those uh, in those cases? It's going to be pretty noisy. Um, you're going to hear a bang and a lot of shaking piping and probably get a phone call from a very scared homeowner. <laughs> and then uh, so kind of what is the the difference between the like the green and the red arrows here. So what what does that do to the paddle if you have the circulator going you know, from the left to the right in the, the photo that we show here? Yeah, so as you can see, the correct direction would be going from the green arrow or the A port and flowing to the B port, where if it were flipped around, either the circulator's pumping it in, into it backwards or the valve is installed backwards, uh, you're gonna get that screen door effect where the the current from the fluid flowing through it is actually going to push on that paddle and slam it shut. And that's where you're going to get your uh, your loud hammering of, of pipes and the rest of the plumbing hooked to it. And that's a, another selling feature of our zone valve there on the left where we've got the double unions. You just split the unions and flip the valve over if that happens. There is an arrow on there. Uh, sometimes when you uh, you lose the little label off and you're not sure what the direction is going through it, but that's a, it's nice to have that. And notice in that picture too, we've got a press fitting on the bottom of that zone valve. We've got, it looks like an FIP fitting on the top. You can mix and match fittings when you have union connection. So it makes it a little bit more versatile for uh, like a service or even a wholesaler. They don't have to have 20 different zone valves on the shelf because they can change the, uh, from sweat to press to thread, or they can change the configuration of the connection by just swapping out a tailpiece. So let's say you're a service contractor and you're coming to an existing building for the first time and the maybe the original installation, the sticker is missing, it you know was kind of heated off when they soldered it if it's integral sweat or something like that. How can you determine the A and the B port after the fact? What are some some things that you could use based on just like looking at the, the valve or taking the actuator off or where would you start to kind of figure out A from well, B? For, for starters, we actually uh, stamp it into the brass, so or it's cast into the brass. It's a raised letter, A port, B port. But the other thing, too, like you look at it, if the A port, if we're going back to that uh, diagram here where our two arrows are, the A port is usually on the side where the actuator grabs and holds on to the, the valve body itself. So a, the upstream side is that side. and if you by some chance can't see it or can't feel it, that's the that's the probably the best indicator. You could also take that bottom cap off. It'd be a little bit more work. You're going to get wet doing that, but you could take that off and see which side the paddle's closing onto us. Um, you know that might be something. If it's a, a union connection, it's not filled with water. You could do a quick check there. If it's not up against, you know, in this case, it looks like that's back against the. The wall there might be a little bit trickier to do that so just seeing where the top you know, kind of mounting support would be would be a good place to start there that cutaway on the right if you had some of the other brands out there and you put them side by side even without them cut away you'll notice that our uh volute you might call it or the you know that casting that's uh, forging that section is much bigger than some of the other brands and so when you have a bigger chamber like a hydraulic separator what happens is the fluid slows down as it comes into that big chamber that makes it easier for that paddle to shut off if you were to make that just a small pipe with a you know just a paddle in there you wouldn't have that chamber for the velocity to decrease and be able to shut off against the flow easier so um, costs a little bit more brass and it looks a little bit bigger when you put it in an insulation but there's a reason that we you know go to that expense and that trouble to make that bigger um, again let's call it a blue like a pump flute that the uh, flow goes through Okay, so let's switch over to some wiring considerations here. So 
Another good resource if you're looking for help to figure out, I don't even know where to start to zone this thing. Why would I choose one versus two versus three you know, different piping arrangements? This Hydronics number 14 is a good look at that to figure out, hey, I could put in a hydro separator and I could do a variable speed pump here and valves versus doing it all with circulators or something like that and kind of finding the combination. One of the things that's helpful too is that we'll publish these piping diagrams as they align with the wiring and color coded too which is helpful to make sure that you're getting everything lined up with where pump one is versus pump two and, and things like that so we talked about this a little bit before so let's say that i am off grid somewhere in the mountains in utah and i just have pv i'm trying to go with the most energy efficient system possible what are the differences in these different valves? And you can see there's kind of something different that happens at the beginning for, for most of them. So Greg, do you want to kind of tell me what you would see? This is an oscilloscope reading for these different valves on for uh, you know a few minutes here. You can see what's the difference? How would you go for the least amount of power uh, to do the same task? Sure. I mean, we're looking at inrush current here, essentially. So the the motorized ball valve like we had said before if you're an off-gridder where you want to consume power that is going to be your best option you're just going to have to do a little bit more wiring to make it work where the the z1 um it's kind of the middle of the road when it comes to amp draw and and continuous draw and then we have our thermal electrics which take a bit more juice to get going and then as you can see they tail off so that's a kind of a, one of the things that comes into play when we talk a little bit later about sizing for a transformer. You want to size best case scenario for all of the peaks here. So if we're gonna size for a zone valve relay for the thermoelectric actuators, even though 99.9% .9 of the life of that actuator may be way down here, which is a, you know, a lower amount of power, we want to make sure that if there was a blackout or something where all of the zone valves are going to come on at the same time, they're all going to be calling for heat, you know, probably not going to happen in normal operation, but in a scenario where the power went out for a few hours, comes back on, that the house is cold, everything's calling, you could spike all of those thermoelectric actuators at the same time in a way that you don't with the other two actuators here. So overall really low amount of power used compared to powering open a motor all the time kind of like we talked about with that the dorm application but you need to size for that inrush current that that first startup amount of electricity and that's where there's a lot of difference in transformer sizing if you're using this number at kind of the the run out here once it's nice and warm versus starting up a cold one or in a cold garage or something like that where you're going to have just a little bit more power required at the beginning that can uh, start to saturate the transformer and we'll kind of show some examples of that as well i don't remember how many years ago it was greg but we came out with a low current draw thermal actuator that one on the top and what we did is we made the little heating element in there smaller so it uses less current draw so you can put a lot more of them on a transformer but it's going to slow down the opening time because that uh what is it the milliamps that we want from 250 to 800 or vice versa um so that time uh axis on the bottom there which shows how long it takes for that to open got a little bit longer but we use less power um you know on our transformer by using those so if you have a radiant manifold for example and you've got maybe what our manifold with 13 actuators on it that you're trying to run off a transformer by having the low power consumption you can load more of uh, those thermal actuators on a note too that not all thermal actuators are created the same there's some brands out there that um take oh, excuse me that pulls current and it overstrokes and it'll take that 0.9 amp and it'll keep hitting 0.9 amp every 15 to 17 seconds and you need to be aware of that when you try and put a lot of those high current draw thermal actuators on a transformer that pull that current uh on a pretty continuous basis where you can see this one we hit it and then we drop down to that low current draw after the wax heats up and it opens so uh you got you got to look at the rating on the the actuators when I think that's our next slide or step here is how to size a transformer with the different types of uh, thermostats and actuators. Yep, we've got that, I think, in a couple slides here. So I'll go on to 
what Greg mentioned before. So uh, tell me when and, and why you would send this wiring diagram out, Greg. Um, the when and where and why, um, a lot of it is because this is not a product that gets used super often because of the fact that it needs to be powered open and powered closed. And it's a, a much higher CV if people are paying attention to what they need for flow rate. It, in some cases can be overkill. So it's always application dependent and um, it, it's it's very uh, much a unique and specialized valve. So we get a guy that's looking to use this. It's very common in heat pump applications, you know, uh, where they need higher flow for for uh, proper heat transfer. So that's when I usually end up sending this particular drawing out for a contractor to be able to wire this in. Yeah, and this is in our installation manuals as well. And you can kind of see two wires in, three wires out. So, you know, how do we kind of adapt that to the signal we might have on site? It has to be a double throw relay because you got to power one set of contacts. And when you shut off your thermostat or whatever, you power the you know, second set of contacts. And the other thing that's nice about the rib relay is when we get to our relay box here in a minute, you can actually fasten them right into the bottom of our relay box in one of the knockouts. And now you have a a code legal thing instead of just putting a transformer on the wall and running power up to it with you know exposed 120 volt okay, wiring out, yeah. put it right into a knockout all your wiring now is inside the relay box and it's an approved uh a way to put a relay a, an additional relay into a uh into a system and the ribs are pretty inexpensive it's a nice little, little relay and you get some of them even with the indicator lights on the light, them yeah. that they're, they're powered so Okay, so then with the motorized valves, we've got a couple different switches. So when would you apply one versus the other? Bob, do you wanna kind of tell us about the difference in the technology and where these switches came from and where you would use them? Yeah, so for the most part, everybody that makes a, a motorized zone valve uses what we call a vending machine switch. It's really a micro switch. And what a micro switch, and it comes, they use them in vending machines. When you pull out the knob, it engages that switch and your candy comes out or whatever. But really, it is just some silver contacts to come together. But the way they come together is a little cam comes across that little tab on the bottom and it pushes those points closed. Uh, the drawback of that type of thing is that there's a couple of things. Is number one, you have to buy them by the current that you're trying to switch. So if you know you want to switch a five amp load, you got to buy that switch with a five amp rating. What happens with that type of switch is uh, contaminants can get inside there, sheetrock dust or pool chemicals that might be in the room. And then those points, uh, the silver points start to corrode and then they come together and they arc and eventually the points fail. So uh, it's a good switch as a place for a switch like that. but. We looked at that switch and actually we went to a manufacturer and said, you know, what would be another switch? What would be a better way to put a switch into a zone valve that wouldn't have those limitations, uh, you know, where you couldn't get dusted and stuff like that? And they suggested that we look at a reed switch. And a reed switch, if you have an alarm system on your building, you'll see them over the top of doors. And the way a reed switch works is that a magnet pulls the points together. And the nice thing about that is the magnet always pulls those two points together at the same amount of tension as the cam wears on a reed switch type of thing or the little tab on there, the points aren't coming together tight and then they arc and then they burn out. So by using a reed switch, we can get two um, problems solved. Number one, we can seal out the contaminants because they dip them in the resin and it's a hermetically sealed switch. And we also get a much lower end switching capacity because switches when you buy a switch not a lot of people know this i didn't that there's actually two ratings on the switch it'll be the high current rating like a five amp switch i think is what we're showing there on the bottom column but there's also a low amp rating and what that means is when silver points come together there needs to be a minimum amount of current going across those points to seal them it's called a sealing current and if you look at like a micro switch like that switch on the left it's got to have a minimum of a 0.25 amps so that when those contacts come together it's actually the current going across there that's helping those seal tight and make it together so where you can run into a problem with a switch that's got a minimum that's not being met and you'll see this on digital controls because digital controls now don't produce that kind of current draw across them so if you don't have enough current going across your end switch the end switch can fail on that so by going to a read switch you can see up on the upper uh, thing there, there's no minimum amount of current draw across that switch to make a good contact because it's the magnet pulling the contacts together and it doesn't need the minimum amount of rating. 
on the other side of that, you give up a little bit of the high end rating on a switch when you go to a read switch. So we would like to see all zone valves wired through a relay box for a couple of reasons that Greg will get into here in a minute when we look at the relay boxes. So you don't put all that stress on your switch. It's actually the relay in the box that's taking the, you know, taking the load more than the end switch. So uh, that's kind of a, uh, maybe not a quick answer, but <laughs> answer to the different types of switches and why we, and we do offer both people there, although you shouldn't, some people like to switch a heavy load through a, an end switch, like a 120 volt circulator pump, not exactly legal, but um, if you knew that five amp switching, we do offer the, what do we, how do we designate it in the price book? I think a HD it's or the high current. Yeah, it's the high current switch. Yeah, but H just H looking at this, right. looking at this drawing that we have right here in front of us, um, I wouldn't want to see um, a Z111 or a 151 installed this way. You know, where the thermostat is is energizing the motor and the uh, the end switch is actually bringing on the boiler. Um, boiler relays vary in what their inrush current is. And we've had our share of service calls come in where someone just bought one off the shelf, a Z111 or a 151, installed it, and they they burn out the end switches. And then they call wondering why that is. Why is this failing? And then we make them aware, hey, that's, that's not a high current switch that's in those. You probably will need a high current switch. So then you got to talk to them about the minimum, like you were getting to. And again, that minimum, if that minimum is not met, that, that set of contacts will chatter. And when they chatter, they start to pit and arc and then they insulate and they don't conduct power anymore. So uh, we always wanna see you guys using a zone valve relay panel like we're gonna discuss here in a minute. So yeah, let's switch over to some, some highlights, I guess, for zone valve relay wiring. So this is going to be a different approach and we can kind of have the relays appropriate for uh, circulators, for our zone circulators and things down here, and then also have some options for powering thermostats. Do you wanna um, kind of both weigh in here what's, what's important, what's useful about using an actual zone valve relay board when you're out in the field instead of just, you could make all of this with rib relays or, or whatever. Uh, why would you use this type of device instead? Well, I think a lot of it is too, just a nice clean install. I mean, trying to troubleshoot a system that is full of peanut relays or rib relays and wire nuts and wire dangling everywhere, it's hard to keep that neat and orderly and really know unless you're really good at labeling things, which we know a lot of people aren't, um, this is all one package, you tie it in, it's all labeled already. Uh, the fact that uh, you just land wires to it and it's got switches and lights on it, you know, lights to indicate that you're getting a call for heat and then you're getting end switch closure and things are energized. Yeah, and the other things, you know, there's a couple things you wanna do is you wanna protect the system. So if you notice over on the left of that board, there's two Molex plugs. So on our relay boxes, you can put, uh, remove the transformer just by plugging out that Molex and plugging a new one in. But to the left of that, those two little yellow, can you quite see them there? Yeah. Uh, those are little thermal overloads. So if somebody um, shorts out the thermostat or the wiring or the, the sheet rocker put a, a screw through your wiring out there and you hook it up to your board here, um, that will protect uh, the transformer. So it'll just pop. If you unplug it, wait a minute or two, plug it back in, you'll actually hear it pop. It'll come back on. So it's kind of like a circuit breaker, but it's a re it resets itself like on a motor. You know, when the thermal overload goes out, you wait a minute, the motor comes back on. So that's going to protect you um, that way. And then um, on the bottom there, all those screws, notice that there's a lot of connections there. So what that means is when we sent this to UL for certification, we thought we were gonna have to put a divider between the low voltage and the high voltage side, like most of the other relay boxes, you'll see there's a little piece of cardboard fiber that goes in there. And so it came back and I said, no, you're fine without it. And they said, well, why is that? <laughs> we didn't know. And they said, well, you've got a connection for every wire that comes into that box to land on. There's no wire nuts required to wire your transformer leads together to your power. So they said, as long as you've got a screw for all your low voltage, you got a screw for your grounds, your uh, neutrals and your line voltage, as long as you've got a place to land those that doesn't require somebody going in there and making their own connection, you don't have to have the divider between the low voltage side and the high voltage side of the board. So it cleans it up a little bit. 
and it's nice to have all those screws. So if you've got you know three green wires coming in that you're grounding your pumps or you're grounding your boiler, whatever, uh, you've got enough screws on there to put two wires under every screw. So if you count the screws times two, that's how many places you have to land um, to land wires. So that cleans it up. The biggest thing that I think happens with this relay board is on the top, you've got three connections. You've got R, W, and C, because a lot of power styling thermostats out there now really want to have a C, and we're going to talk about that more when we size a transformer. So by having them on the board, we don't have to search around for the other side of the transformer to take a C out to your power styling thermostat. It makes it simple. And by color coding them, you make sure that you get the three on the zone one on zone one, and the zone two is on the green one, and then the black and then the green. So by color coding, you don't get a wire, you know, off one screw as you go across the board. So, you know, little things like that, that help certainly the um, the newbies in the industry that are, you know, not familiar with wiring this. You want to make it as, as, you know, visual and as simple as they can. Give them the screws for the wires. Give them the C, you know, connection for your thermostats and then the indicator lights and uh, uh, the fuses and stuff like that. So, so we've got a couple more up slides about, to go through that we'll do. Um, quick so we can try and land right at the top of the hour one of the things that just in the last 10 years has changed is thermostats went from some just like invisible thing on walls to now people want a cool thermostat that they can access from their phone and without having a, a third connection here to have a, a constant common uh, you can run into some some issues there and we'll show a couple quick examples of those towards the end here so one quick thing to mention with zone valves uh, there are a lot of cases that there are going to be a mix of zone valves in an existing project over different generations, whatever was on the service contractor's truck that day may go in. Uh, there is a lot of flexibility with this own relay panel that you could use other brands, two or four wire, or these three wire versions, or even this kind of complicated White Rogers wiring diagram here to make sure that you've got the, the power that you need to, to toggle that on and off properly. So flexibility in the, the field is always helpful. Okay, zone pumps. So one of the things we'll show in a new photo, we don't have this exact photo of the new one. We used to have an integral built into the board transformer as shown here. We've switched to that Molex plug like we showed on the, the last one. I'll show a picture on the next slide here. Um, any other highlights, Greg, for um, something that's you know useful with the zone pump relay if you're doing all your zoning with uh, circulators instead of valves? Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, I think one of the cool features is the fact that you can do remote enable with this, um, you know, to be able to hold off the heating panel if the boiler is designated to do the domestic hot water. Uh, we got fuses in there, obviously. So if you have a problem on the high voltage side, it'll open a fuse. They're replaceable. Uh, same style of uh, uh, thermal fuse on there, the thermal uh, reset. It, you shut the power off and let it cool down, power it back up, and then start into your troubleshooting. And again, they're they're also you can combine these together to make more than just a, a a three to six zone panel you can tie multiple panels together through the comps terminals and you can even tie them together with a zvr that's been done a few times too for those uh, what we call franken systems that are out there yeah and i think we've got a we've got an example of that in a couple slides so this is what the this was greg went and took this out in the warehouse yesterday uh, the new zone you can see this kind of big void that's left here because we now have a, a plug-in molex transformer there like we do for the zone valve relay panel. So that's helpful to um, for troubleshooting and installation as well. Okay, so let's do kind of a, a lightning round through a couple example systems. So Greg mentioned sometimes this is a you know a cool example of a lot of zone valves and a lot of zone pumps that we would be able to then daisy chain through the comms terminals a zone valve relay together with a zone pump relay and scaling kind of to your imagination. I mean, I think that there's there um, there's not really a limit for how many of these that you could toggle together and they're gonna be you know, powered with their own individual transformers. I don't know that we've ever seen one with more than eight of these boxes on the wall. I but, actually um, guy, had a guy call in with 20 of them put together. It was oh, a yeah. very big, yeah, very big complex. Was that for your uh, your hunting lodge? 
Greg, that uh, no, it was not. Some, some guy called in for that. Uh, it was the vacation fishing lodge, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can uh, scale that as you need for the, the project. So if we get a call, so if Greg gets a call and they say, hey, this thing isn't working right, I, I, you know, I, I've blown a transformer or you know, we don't have 24 volts anymore, uh, what should we be looking for here? So Greg, do you want to kind of walk us through a couple questions that you would ask and then we'll show three different project examples to see how this lines up to what to expect? Yeah, I mean, if I get a phone call from somebody who's who's having issues, they haven't yet let the factory smoke out of the transformer. They've just <laughs> hit, shut the lights off, you know, close its eyes for a minute. Um, we start with isolating all the low voltage devices off of it if it's a ZVR panel. Even if it's a ZSR, there's only one thing that's causing that that trip, and that's something on the low voltage side. So we're isolating all the devices off. I'm having them reset power, and they can verify power too with a meter. Make sure that they have 24 volts between R and C up at the, the up at the thermostat connections, mm -hmm. and we just start going through things. You can home out wiring. You can you can try and plug them back in one zone at a time if you don't have a meter, which you know, there's plenty of people out there that don't. Uh, and that's kind of getting to, to it the easiest way is plugging things in one at a time and cycling it on. And whatever makes the lights go off, there's your problem. That's the start of it. And then we we go through uh, trying to figure out how to use that meter if they do have it, because not everybody knows how to use it. Okay, so let's do a couple examples here. We'll do kind of a, a bonus round. So let's i'll get a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the two of you do we look like we're in good shape here if we've got a four valve relay board so we've got 40 va we're measuring 27 vac at the transformer so we say 24 volts as an industry but you want to check your transformer because it it you know with no load you may see a higher number there and when it's fully loaded down you may see that number come back down so you know what are we actually looking at at the job site if you're getting more than 120 volts in or something like that too Let's say we've got three mercury mercury bulb thermostats, kind of old school technology there. Still a little bit of a resistor there. So you may still have a load. It seems like you should have zero, but you may you know, check with your thermostat manufacturer. You may have a little bit of a published load there. And then we've got three motorized zone valves, kind of like shown here. So thumbs up or thumbs down here. Got a thumbs up. Okay, we've got a, a no vote from Bob. So we've got... Uh, we're going to say we're in the green here. So if we add all this up, we're under our 40 VA transformer capacity. We're in good shape with the insulation kind of as, as shown here. This was actually a, a job site that Cody Mack, one of our other trainers, did that, that looks really nice with the connections uh, back to this panel. So example two, we've got a few boards on the wall here. We've got a lot more zone valves hooked up to them. Uh, this is a, a, a cool project from Phillips uh, Lake Home Comfort. So Thumbs up or thumbs down on this one. We've got each panel is going to have 80 VA if they're a six zone valve relay board. We'll say that we've got a simple programmable thermostat. So that's pulling in 11 VA there. Uh, thumbs up or thumbs down on, on this one. Thumbs up. Okay. Nod yes from Bob. So, okay. Yeah, we're in good shape there. We're going to be under our 80 VA capacity. Uh, if you, for some reason, had, you know, all of these zone valves coming back to zone one on one of these boards or something like that, uh, that could take you over your individual board number of 80. But if we're just kind of generally looking at one thermostat to one zone, uh, we're in, in great shape there with a little bit of capacity to even do a couple zone valves per. So now let's look at this simple example for number three. So we'll say we've got a four pump relay board, uh, we're 25 volts measured at the transformer. We've got three really cool uh, cell phone accessible Wi-Fi thermostats that are the, the best on the market and the homeowners love. Uh, zone pumps, so no additional VA load there. What about this one? We're getting a thumbs down from Greg. So we're not going to put anybody on uh, on blast here from the thermostat manufacturer side, but really check whatever thermostat you're installing in these new Wi-Fi stats. You want to check and see what the VA draw is. I've seen on some of the help forms for these individual thermostats that 
uh, a simple wiring diagram through a relay, they're saying we need a 20 VA transformer per thermostat. And that, that's the type of thing that you could overload one of these relay boards. That's just a lot more power than we were expecting. Uh, still can be done. Just know that you might need to go with a six zone relay board for four Wi-Fi stats or something like that, that you split up two and two to kind of split that load on the two different transformers as an example, or just verify what the, the zone valve, or sorry, what the thermostat people actually need for an amp draw there to make sure you're not overloaded. No, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but our uh, six zone valve, our relays are in parallel. They're not, some of the brands, 40 VZ is on the first three and 40 is on the other. Right. We got 80 VA across the board. So if you did have six high draw zone valves on zone one, you've got the 80 VA available on That's a good point. Board, yeah. Not half and half. So that can help. Yeah, not to actually split it. That's yeah. correct. And just getting back to the, the thermostats real quick, the high draw it doesn't come from just switching on and off. It's when they recharge the battery. That's where we see yeah. the problem with over amping. So when some of these go to recharge that little coin sized battery in there, they're really putting a lot of draw in. And if they're all installed at the same time, they all hit the recharge at the same time. And that's what usually overloads things. Yeah, so that can be a, a tricky troubleshooting thing too, because you could go measure it right now and not see a big draw. And then it pulls that you know big draw to charge the battery and you're gonna be in a different shape after you've left the troubleshooting scenario or something. A year later, you've had calls. Yeah. It worked fine for the first year and now it blew out. Well, the battery yeah. hit, hit the charger you know, a year later, and now you're, you're over your current. Okay, well, I think that that takes us to the end. So um, we'll maybe see if Kevin has any questions that came in that would be good to address while we're still in the webinar. We also get back to everybody who sent a question in. So if you've got something that seems like it's more job site specific, we'll reach out to you and make sure that we get an answer to you if it's something that's a little bit more complex or we've got some follow-up questions about uh, anything that, that sticks out on the, the technical question side? Yes, we have a question for Greg. What's a pump and dump? A pump and dump. That's a geothermal system. So where water is brought in from the source, run through the, the, the geothermal heat pump, and it is dumped back out into the source. So through a pond or into a creek or something like that. Perfect. Yeah, check Thank with, you. Uh, check with the... Uh, the locals on that one if that's legal to do too there are some not, places not, where not everywhere it is it, i mean we yeah. have a few spots in our state here where the community actually allows that yeah there's a there's an interesting one of those for the university of utah the football stadium uh, actually pulls into an aquifer and they're allowed to to do that but they do heat pumps and low temperature kind of pump and dump uh, geo exchange with an aquifer and they're able to, to run a whole south end zone part of the stadium at really low temperature with that type of application. So, but but check and make sure that that's, uh, that's gonna be okay. That uh, can yeah. be a good way to go. That's all we have. Ooh. Great. Great. Well, um, thank you everyone. We'll wrap it up there with a couple of last slides. If you wanna ask Greg a specific question, a, a less bearded version of uh, Greg. You can call this tech support line and get directly to those guys or email us. Uh, if you want a Hawaiian shirt, uh, summer solstice version of uh, Bob Rohr to answer the question to reach out there as well. And we'll get that passed along to the, the proper channels. Um, let's see, so that there's all sorts of great troubleshooting advice from Greg and Dan on our podcast. Check that out, that can be a good drive into the job site way to hear uh, similar information as well from the support lines. We love seeing your job site photos. We love to kind of repost those and, and share those with more people if you're doing cool projects out there. So uh, tag us on these platforms and we'll uh, be happy to share your content. Thank you again. Uh, we'll get back to anybody that had questions that we didn't get to that were more specific. And that's all we have today. So thank you for joining Coffee with Kalefi. We'll see you next month for heat pump water heater applications, heat pump water heater uh, considerations. So thank you again. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.